All right. A very good evening to everyone on behalf of Nehru Planetarium, Nehru Memorial Museum and Library. Myself, Prerna, welcome you all for joining. We are really very much delighted to host this interesting session with you all. Planetarium is privileged to host Dr. Narayan Prasad with us today. So today, Dr. Narayan Prasad, along with them, Mr. Sne, astronomer and also an entrepreneur of Space Science Education Organization, will be joining us to share their journey with us. So we'll begin with uh, Dr. Prasad, and later Sne will join. Dr. Prasad is a co-founder of SatSearch, a global marketplace for space, with a mission to consolidate the global space industry supply chain, fostering increased collaboration, state-of-the-art development and transparency within the market. SatSearch has over 10,000 monthly active users from 100 plus countries and help 2,000 suppliers connect with the buyers in the space industry. Also serve as a partner to the Space Park Kerala, a Government of Kerala initiative to develop a space economy hub in India. If we talk about his educational background, he did his PhD in supply chain management uh, from uh, Friedrich Alexander University, Erlingen, Nuremberg, Germany, driven research based on applying supply chain management principle to using satellite big data analytic for decision intelligence in sector, such as agriculture, finance, industry, energy, etc. He did his master in space technology, Sweden, and a master in space techniques and in instrumentation, France, and have been previously worked on research project with the Indian Institute of Astrophysics. DLR Institute of Space System, Germany, with an interest in learning more in the realm of space policy, he's also got his master in space and telecom law from the Center of Air and Space Law of Nalsar Law University, Hyderabad. He also a curator of New Space India, a community and an online publication dedicated to crafting a new space community India and presenting in-depth analysis of issues around the Indian space program to the outside world. This is India's only space-focused podcast. Planetarium, welcome you, sir. As we uh, all know, you have very wide background with so many new terms coming in our head, space policy, space law, and what your organization really do. I think will be very much interesting and to give more insight, like how you started your journey, and you can if uh, you can share all the related works, will be really much interesting for all the participants who are there live. So over to you. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Um, I uh, maybe I can spend some time talking about uh, my own background and you know where I am doing stuff now, and people can then see if they have any questions. I'm happy happy to answer them. Um, I uh, was very lucky to basically be a part of uh, other friends who were building hardware projects, uh, hands-on projects. Um, unfortunately, you know, most people I know who are very good at astronomy and astrophysics and things like that, uh, they have always an interest as young children. Uh, and they go to the planetarium and then they, they attend sessions at the planetarium and basically they uh, get their interest there. Uh, unfortunately, in my case, I did not have any such interest in uh, space science, uh, you know, when I was uh, in school or so on. So uh, I actually did not really focus on anything like that. Uh, but I was lucky to actually have uh, met some friends who uh, during my undergraduate days, uh, you know, started to do something more on uh, micro air vehicles and aircrafts and then led to satellites. So that's when I really got introduced to the world of space and uh, satellites. And essentially the project that I was kind of involved in on uh, the aviation side was to build a, a micro air vehicle uh, on the aviation side and then to build a, a micro satellite on the satellite side. So that was, you know, the first real exposure that I had uh, that was a very much of a hands-on project where we were running a lot of the simulation. We were building, trying to build a lot of the uh, structural aspects of satellites and, and so on. And this was for uh, uh, astrophysics mission for a far UV astronomy um, uh, kind of a payload. And uh, although, I mean, we were not nowhere related to 
the physics part of the whole thing where we were not really involved in the instrumentation of the satellite or you know studying the nature of the results that were coming out of the satellite our role was more or less in the uh, structural design and and so on of the of the mission and so that's where we got a lot of the knowledge and so uh, that project went on for about a couple of years and uh, you know i do recommend uh, anybody out there who are, who is trying to get into this sector uh, of space uh, you know try to do some kind of hands on projects by yourself i think it's a, it's one of the great ways of actually learning uh, outside of uh, the bookish knowledge that uh, you know traditionally the system has so uh, i was since i was quite uh, interested in this area i eventually ended up uh, getting a scholarship to study in europe uh, you know that was more than 10 years ago and essentially that led to me studying in a special european union program between germany sweden uh, and france i spent like 6 months each in each country under a european union program for space uh, studies and uh, essentially you know had an opportunity to study on small satellites on um, stuff like auroras northern lights uh, and uh, and also studying things like space instrumentation building of uh, astronomy instruments things like that for uh, satellite based observations and uh, and also then uh, worked on um, uh eventually also worked with uh, the german aerospace center in in germany to work on uh, interplanetary missions to uh, look at uh, development of uh, greenhouses for for mars and places like that so uh let's i i also happen to then uh, get a very keen interest on um, uh space entrepreneurship uh, because uh, you know space entrepreneurship back in 2010 2011 already was very very new at that time uh, people were not even using the word uh, startup uh, at that point of time more rigorously as they do today uh, but essentially i think uh, we were one of the earliest companies uh, uh, that we started in india through our space uh, that is based in hyderabad now you know uh, was one of the earliest companies that looked at uh, building a, a space startup out of india that uh, would do small satellites right so um, yeah i think this was uh, some sort of a natural transition for us because uh, when we were kind of studying in uh, in europe one of the things that we noticed is uh, you know why can't we actually build some of this equipment and and sell to people around the world and uh, we saw that as an opportunity saying that uh, we can do this in india at uh, a far more cheaper cost for the same amount of quality uh and then you know look at how we could use that leverage to to then occupy a, a better global market share so that was you know the intention of uh, how we started our company uh, back uh, back in india um eventually i made my way back uh, to to europe and i've been here for the last 5 uh, uh, years or so now uh, and essentially my company here uh, which is based in the netherlands is uh, is building a marketplace it was built a marketplace for the space industry where we uh, work with suppliers and so on so uh, i think space for young people uh, either uh, you know has uh, two specific opportunities in my mind uh, one is uh, you can go into more of the scientist track where you can uh, work on more of the the science track of it where you're either building instruments or uh, analyzing data from space and and that's a more scientific track and i don't know much about that particular track um i mean although i've done enough research and so on so i did not really have an interest in in pursuing a career fully focused on research so um after my phd i i stopped working really on uh, on anything really scientific to the, of that nature uh, but but yeah but if uh, somebody is really interested in in that particular track it's a separate track altogether and you know there are of course a couple of uh, podcasts that i have recorded with uh, jayant murthy from uh, the indian institute of astrophysics or a couple of other uh, astronomers that are out there who talk about uh, potential opportunities if you are from india and want to take that particular track uh, feel free to go and listen to some of that and you will get a sense of which are the possibilities to take such a career path uh, but as far as uh, you know entrepreneurship or building companies as concerned uh, that's where let's say my experience fits a little bit more 
and uh, that's where i'm interested in uh, more as well so essentially it's the idea of actually building you know uh, space based products or services uh, either you are building something that goes into space or using something that is already in space to to do something on the ground uh, and that's where you know my real interest is in as well and uh, essentially it's to look at uh, you know how do you actually build something that can go into space and can provide some services to people on the ground or uh, use something that is already in space for example a camera for example that is already flying in space and then you can use that to provide kind, some kind of a service that uh, people can use uh, on the ground so uh, this i think is a, is again a very early stage opportunity for many many young people i see that uh, in india there's about 15 new companies that have come up in the last 5 uh, years or so who are uh, building some very exciting technology and uh, some very exciting uh, products and services that are coming out as uh, space entrepreneurs uh, many of you might know like elon musk or jeff bezos or others uh, who are also building you know companies of that uh, grand stature but uh, there's also i would say enough entrepreneurs in india that are coming out as well who are building some very interesting technology and very interesting products so um if uh, if any of you are interested in that particular track uh, that has a lot of scope of course uh, in india today but it's of course a much uh, risky track to take because uh, you're trying to build something that is uh, original and that's always kind of difficult and it's much more difficult in a in a sector like space because normally it takes 5 7 10 years before a particular space company becomes uh, very successful so uh, it's 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 not for the light hearted uh, at the end uh, but uh, but yeah if if any of you are kind of interested in that particular track i am uh, of course you know happy to to answer any questions that you have in that particular track um, i don't want to take much of the time and leave more time for the q and a and so on i know that even snay has to talk so uh, maybe we can uh, you know after snay i guess uh, provides his opening remarks we can jump into the q and a Thank you. Mm, sure, 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 sir. Uh, we can definitely. But uh, sir, as as a curious participant, we are also interested to know the terms uh, like space law, and what are the space policy. If you can elaborate, because uh, students and even I am personally interested to a little more insight on these terms. Sure, sure. Um, it's uh, space law is just an extension of. Uh, you know what is laws on the ground or maritime laws or aviation laws to to the outer space um, you know back in the day when uh, the cold war was it at its peak and the sputniks uh, you know the sputnik satellite was launched uh, there were of course a few scenarios right where basically uh, you know there was a case where if nuclear weapons could be sent up into space and stored uh, on orbit they could be you know Uh, re uh, you know sent sent back to the earth and you could basically threaten other countries with such sort of uh, uh, weapons in outer space for example right so or for example let's ca- take a case scenario where an american astronaut would be in space and let's say something emergency happens and they have to reorbit and let's say they would have landed in the soviet union at that time uh, they are cold war enemies so you know what happens to that astronaut so uh, will you treat them as a spy or you know a foreign citizen and then will you prosecute them things these kinds of questions you know came up a lot because uh, countries uh, built up capabilities very very quickly and essentially you did not want uh, you know countries to use space for threatening each other or threatening mm-hmm. each other's people right so that's when the whole space law aspect came up uh, in in terms of treaties so essentially you know space law is uh, nothing but uh, a set of treaties that are signed by you know all the un countries many of the un countries if not all uh, to to abide by some basic rules so one of the most basic treaties that are out there is called the outer space treaty where basically you are declaring that uh, you know if the us is called to the moon it doesn't mean that the us owns the moon so Uh, these are you know some of the basic aspect of the treaty where you cannot simply go to a celestial object and plant a flag there and says say that this is now my territory nobody can come here right and it's the same for the safety and protection of astronauts uh, it's the same for you know looking at uh, using space for only peaceful purpose, purposes and not really using space for uh, 
you know, uh, putting in weapons uh, of any kind or so on. So, and, and essentially, you know, giving equitable access to, to other countries. Uh, so these are all uh, some of the most basic uh, aspects of the space law. Uh, so there is no space police where basically if uh, somebody does the wrong thing that uh, people will come and catch hold of somebody. Uh, it's basically uh, in a set of international, uh, let's say, treaty that is signed between governments and essentially, you know, governments hold true to that treaty so that uh, there may not be any sanctions or anything like that that will be put on those countries, right? So even India is a, is a part of the Outer Space Treaty and everything that we are doing in terms of space law is in accordance with that. So space policy is uh, slightly different than, uh, than space law. Law is something where you, know, you have uh, something that is already passed legislatively or is done at the international level with uh, countries signing agreements within, between each other. Uh, but essentially a space policy is uh, something that you do for your own country. So essentially, for example, now India is uh, put out a draft uh, policies in multiple areas. For example, what happens when uh, uh, you know one of the private companies wants to launch a rocket or a private company wants to launch cameras into space. So that's when you come up with your own space policies. And uh, essentially that's when you, know, you come up with a way or a format in which uh, Companies in your country, for example, uh, you know, come uh, can use that particular instrument or can use that particular policy to then say uh, they have, like, say, the support from the government to to undertake or get a license, for example, uh, to to be a functional as a company. So, for example, you know, space policy for space transportation may allow companies like Skyroot or Agnicol or other such startups to. Uh, use uh, Sri Harikota as a as a launch base to do some of their tests or launch from there, or uh, it'll also ask them to take uh, an insurance, for example, for any damages or you know uh, or have some safety checks before they launch or so on. So this is the uh, the nature of uh, space policy. Uh, it could be either space policy in nationally or internationally as well. Uh, so even in that case, uh, you know, India might say that we have a space policy that says, uh, you know, we don't want to, for example, uh, you, know, uh, you know, put weapons in outer space or we have, uh, we don't want to use it for uh, security uh, aspects or so on. So those could be some something that the government says more internationally as a definition. But uh, there's two aspects of it. One is you govern your own uh, companies with space policy, or you can govern your own behavior as to what you will be doing uh, as uh, as future. So for example, India may put out a policy tomorrow saying that, uh, you know, we want to go extract resources from moon or so on. And that could be a space policy that India has uh, created uh, for itself, that it will uh, provide all the support for both ISRO as well as uh, other companies that are out there to go mine stuff on the moon, for example. So that could be as well. So those are uh, some of the distinctions. I hope uh, it's useful. Yes, definitely. In, indeed, sir. Uh, as you said, there is no a po police, a space police or something. So if a uh, country who's not a part of that treaty, if they do anything uh, related to space, or is there any permission or something they have to follow the protocols or the law? And who is the governing uh, body? Like uh, we say, if we come under the UN or so, if com a country who is not a part of that UN, and if they want to do certain project in uh, space, so where they have to take the channel, what is the channel, and like from whom they have to take the permissions and all? So uh, if they are not a part of the UN and you know they don't follow a lot of the rules, uh, you know, for example, a country like North Korea, uh, for example, they can conduct some routine uh, rocket launches to see if they can send satellites uh, up or missiles up, for example. Uh, in their case, you know, uh, they they are threatening other countries, right, with their uh, weapons. Uh, and missiles uh, and you know so are trying to put in some of the satellites through that as well in these cases these are all dual use uh, equipment right so in that case uh, although you know there is no space police as i said again uh, the other countries might just say we are not going to work with uh, north korea we, we are not going to allow our companies to send any equipment to them or send any you know sensors or any devices or have any in information exchange with that particular country. So that uh, makes it much more difficult for them to 
to do anything on their own so uh, this is one of the ways in which uh, countries kind of uh, make sure that there is uh, you know people who are uh, good intention get supports and and people who don't have any good intentions they will not be supported in one way or the other uh, there are some international bodies that are concerned uh, with respect to some of the aspects of space so for example there is the international telecommunications union uh, the itu for example and that uh, particular you know body is look is mostly concerned about uh, radio frequency so for example if you want to launch a satellite and it wants to, the satellite is providing a particular service so let's say the service is to provide internet from space uh, that's a new thing that a lot of companies are now doing so in that case you know you have to make sure that that particular frequency uh, does not interfere with other satellites or with other types of users so that's when you know you have something like an international body like the itu uh, which then does the coordination between different countries to then allocate different parts of the radio frequency to different use cases for example and then you know they may say that okay uh, you can use uh, whatever you know 2.8 gigahertz to 3 gigahertz or something like that uh, to do you know uh, broadband connectivity from space and you know for example 2.4 gigahertz is one of the ism bands which is the open band that's where all the wifi equipment and all the other open equipment is based on and so they allocate these frequencies and you know uh, essentially companies and countries uh, follow these laws uh, these rules by the itu and then uh, essentially they provide the 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 frequency all all allocation that people have to build stuff so that uh, equipment don't interfere with each other and there's uh, there's also you know like uh, you can provide a service without any interruption uh, in that case right so uh, those are some of the aspects but uh, at the end you know it's every country uh, who is uh, uh, a part of the outer space treaty and other such uh, space policy into the laws uh, they have to supervise what is going on uh, in their country so for example let's say in india you have a private company or even a, a private person uh, let's say some high school student or whoever launches a particular satellite by themselves uh without you know taking clearance from the government or so on uh they may easily take the satellite in a small you know uh, box or something like that today's satellites are also becoming small if they just say take uh, as an assumption take a particular satellite in a suitcase and then they launch it out of the us uh, rocket uh, since this uh, satellite comes from uh, from india uh, or an indian person is actually launching this then uh, automatically according to international law Uh, the country becomes responsible for that particular asset regardless of the person or the company and this is why you know today you, you have uh, the formation of in space as a regulator in india or uh, more and more focus on this space policy and law aspects coming up in india because today you are seeing more and more private companies that are coming up uh, that want to do something more in space and uh, and then you know that's how they are uh, uh, looking at uh, governing the whole thing because for the last uh, 50 years or so isro was doing everything and isro is a government institution so they don't need to really uh, monitor anything by themselves but uh, but since now there's a lot of interesting private companies that are coming up uh, this is why we are creating all of this uh, space policy and law and, and so on so that the government can keep track of uh, who is doing what and uh, you know provide appropriate licenses to people so that uh, there is supervision available from uh, what is going on whatever is happening uh, great that that clearly gives us an intent that it's a responsibility as well so uh, i think we got uh, very much insight related to the uh, knowledge which uh, narayan prasad sir has shared i think students have any doubts you can drop uh, into the chat box and after uh the discussion like after when we'll have the discussion we'll will be taking your question so you can drop meanwhile you can anything coming in your mind you can drop in the chat box i'll be i will be taking those questions so with this uh we'll uh go to our next guest with us sne uh if you talk about sne sne is a science communicator by work and astronomer by hobby with close to 25 years now pursuing astronomy and stargazing as hobby snae is well versed with the concepts of astronomy and space sciences 
He has about more than 11 years now professionally experience of teaching astronomy to kids and has catered to nearly 400 schools over 50,000 students in last decades. Knowledge of night sky and astrophotography are his strongest point over than teaching to young kids. Last two years, Ney is successfully running his own firm, which provide all round solutions for astronomy enthusiasts, be it learning about the sky, science, or buying equipment. Sne is also great with kids and explains the scientific concept very well. Sne has a degree in mechanical engineering, but chose astronomy as his career. In his free time, Sne likes to travel, photograph, and discuss about the astronomical equipment with friends and amateur astronomers. So from uh, engineering to astrophysics or uh, space and stargazing, uh, Sne will like to know more detail about. Um, thank you very much for having me. Am I audible? Yes, yes, you are audible, Sne. All right. Uh, thank you very much for having me. It's a, a wonderful opportunity to come back and speak to the amateurs and thank you very much Naransar for giving us such a wonderful insight about all the latest technological advancements in the field of space science communication and uh, uh, space laws and space policies it was very enlightening uh, my journey started uh, way back like when i probably when i was a kid six seven eight year old uh, we used to go to our grandmother's house every summer vacation and uh, all our cousins and relatives would come, you know, would assemble there for a week's time. And uh, uh, in, in the summer uh, evenings, we would spend time on the terrace, probably sleep over there on the terrace. And we, I personally uh, love to enjoy the stars in the sky. Uh, back in the days, the skies were much clearer and you could see about 1,000, 1,200 stars from, uh, you know, just on the outskirts of the city. Uh, I think that was the turning point of my life where I, uh, rather than looking at the conventional methods or conventional fields, uh, uh, you know, a profession, I uh, knew my love and passion for the stars. And since then, I have... Uh, been trying to collect information as a student and, uh, you know, uh, just going around, talking to people, uh, visiting planetariums and attending uh, these kind of lectures and conferences. Unfortunately, back in the days, internet was not as uh, easy as it is now. So it was always a challenge. You have to be alert. You have to have the, you know, the right contact who can update you about these programs. So it was very challenging back then. Uh, after completing my school, uh, uh, just you know, just around the same time, giving my final year exams, I was, uh, I came in touch with uh, Dr. Ratnashi, who was the director of Nehru Planetarium, and uh, she uh, started including me into various projects that Planetarium had undertaken, uh, you know, in the last uh, fifteen years or so, and that is where my journey started. Uh, for the uh, sake of a, a, a degree or a professional qualification, I got into engineering and uh, my, I was always interested in astronomy, always. like uh, There's not even a single day when I don't go out and look at the sun or the moon or the stars or anything. And uh, the most interesting part is uh, that uh, you don't really have to be at a specific place to do it. Uh, wherever you are, just go out and uh, you can just look up and see the sky. And I think that was something which was really adding to uh, my passion and my interest. So after completing my engineering, I came back to Delhi and uh, I joined a company uh, which were uh, promoting science communication. And I worked with them for four years. Then I moved to another company who had a different understanding and a slightly different approach to science communication and uh, I uh, worked with them for three years. In those seven years of professional career, I uh, was lucky to interact with thousands of students and uh, uh, institutions, uh, met a lot of, uh, you know, subject matter experts, uh, scientists, astronomers and uh, leaders of the field. While I was Doing all this, I 
uh, had a, a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, I had this thing in mind that even whatever uh, we are all trying to do, uh, it's not really a complete solution. So uh, that is when uh, I formulated this company, Astrophile Education, uh, which is actually part of a bigger uh, umbrella of companies. Uh, and our aim is to deal with uh, providing all sorts of astronomy solutions to the amateurs. Uh, the most important factor uh, behind starting uh, this uh, company or uh, you know creating this uh, organization was uh, to overcome the problems that uh, as a child i faced uh, first of all there are lack of resources there is lack of information and there's a lot of misinformation uh, there are a lot of resources available but uh, the students really doesn't know how to do it and the most important aspect is uh, our school curriculum still does not recognize astronomy as a full-fledged subject, but has, uh, you know, a, a bits and bits of uh, 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 topics covered in different uh, age, age groups and in different books in, uh, you know, in a different ways. So astronomy is not really uh, something which uh, has been taught as a subject to any of us. So why? we should study astronomy is uh, you know something that i'm going to talk about but the most important aspect is that uh, astronomy is uh, a subject uh, that requires a lot of patience it requires uh, a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of interest already and uh, because the objects are so far away and the weather and uh, all these phenomena that we are experiencing today are uh, very difficult to get rid of, uh, it is more and more, uh, you know, becoming challenging to experience what, uh, you know, a good sky or filled with stars or what nebulae or galaxies would actually uh, look like. So uh, when uh, this whole thing started, our aim was to provide solution to each and every individual who has even the slightest of interest in astronomy. Uh, so the interest starts at a root level, that is at a very young age, because uh, students are, uh, you know, uh, very easy to involve into various things, not only uh, because uh, they are young and they are enthusiastic, uh, they are in, uh, they have this tendency of uh, experiencing everything, but also at the right age, if uh, they are given the proper training and proper understanding, they will have, a, you know, a, a better career prospect uh, in the future. And the career prospect not only uh, is limited to, uh, you know, becoming an astrophysicist or becoming an astronomer, anybody, uh, you know, an engineer, a doctor, uh, a mathematician, an accountant, or a lawyer, for that matter, anybody uh, with any kind of interest in any of the field uh, can actually uh, work in the field of astronomy like as uh Naran sir was talking about space laws uh these laws were not directed by uh, the government government but there were uh lawyers and uh, you know all uh, people from all walks of life were involved with their suggestions with their inputs and everything uh after which these laws were framed uh, the policies, uh, they require different kind of engineers and technicians who can exactly guide uh, based on the bandwidth uh, you can uh, use and the uh, devices you have on board, uh, the cameras, manufacturers. So if you are, uh, even if you are a photographer, your suggestions are welcome as to how to take the, uh, you know, the, uh, the picture of the farthest galaxies, which are, you know, beyond 14.7 billion years ago, which can give you a little insight about the big so astronomy is not only about studying the sky astronomy is a, it's it's a it's a field it's a subject it's it's pretty much uh, something parallel to science in itself uh, whenever you are uh, uh, learning about a planet let's say jupiter you are talking about the uh, the physics of jupiter that is super massive it's its shape and its size and uh, whether it has a solid surface at the center or not. 
at the same time we are talking about the chemical composition as well uh, for example how much amount of hydrogen is there how much amount of uh, helium is there or methane is there or other gases are there uh, what is the density of these gases and uh, uh, you know uh, these kind of things at the same time we are looking for the signs of life so we need uh, uh, you know uh, a botanist or a zoologist uh, someone who has uh, 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 you know a good command over uh, biology who understands how life originated on earth who, how life sustain what are the conditions where the life can sustain and then help astronomers uh, look at those uh, features on uh, specific bodies or specific planets or their moons and so on uh, we need computer experts. The computer experts would be uh, writing programs so that most of this research work is uh, done, you know, using these uh, softwares and it saves uh, thousands of man hours, uh, which a particular individual may have to invest in order to come up with a solution. So astronomy is not just about, you know, having a telescope and looking up in the sky. It definitely keeps your passion alive, but at the same time, it also helps you in, uh, you know, uh, astronomy is also uh, about doing everything that you want to do and combine it with your hobby, with your passion, that is astronomy. So when I uh, started, I started visiting schools and I started talking to kids. Uh, the students of grade four, five, six, uh, they have some of the most amazing questions. And trust me, their questions never stop. They are so inquisitive about space. Even with very limited exposure, they have so many questions. And some of the questions will have really stunned me, like a kid of probably seven or eight year old. How come he or she has such a, you know, a great insight about uh, I'm talking to a, a grade five student uh, uh, these days, and he is uh, thinking about moving humanity from Earth to a different galaxy around a black hole with, uh, you know, a nearby star and harness the energy so that the human race can survive even when the sun dies, even when uh, the Earth is engulfed by the sun. So these are some of the, uh, you know, the students who have a very different understanding of astronomy as compared to others and uh, they don't have a place or uh, to go uh, where they can get the answers where they can find a solution to it and uh, with my little knowledge and understanding about space whatever i can help and uh, i suggest i recommend uh, if it helps them i feel very honored one of the aspects of uh, uh, our work as a science communicator is to communicate science in the right way. And the best possible way to communicate science is to bring experiments to a student's table or, or, or their seat. So uh, we do certain programs where the students can participate directly, uh, uh, you know, uh, with, uh, with us or uh, you know with the international organizations who organize these kind of competitions activities events projects and so on uh, so we have kind of become a mediator between uh, these institutions who hold these programs and the institutions who are looking for such programs and uh, it has channelized uh, better uh, for the students as well as the schools in india and uh, the same uh, principle is being applied to other countries. There are people like us in other countries as well who does this science communication part. And uh, this is uh, uh, where the students get an opportunity to participate and to keep doing things that will motivate them. One of the projects that we do is called Asteroid Search Campaign, where the students uh, work on real-time data and they, uh, you know, they kind of... Uh, use a, a software designed by a software engineer. Uh, they collect, uh, they receive data from a telescope, uh, which is located in Hawaii. It's a 1.8 meter observatory class telescope. And uh, they use uh, different methods to find if there is an asteroid in the data set or not. The idea is very simple. You just have to find an asteroid. If you find one, 
your life has changed forever. If you find a comet of an asteroid, or uh, if you, if you, even if you have found something new on your own, or if there's something already known, but you have found it on your own for the very first time, it's a, a life altering event. Uh, it's called success. And uh, the success means you are ready for the next step. Uh, you are uh, learning better and, uh, you know, uh, you are ready to grow further. Uh, and we are always working with the students. So even if they are like going about it, uh, if they have any uh, delays or uh, in understanding or if they are slightly slower than others, then also it's fine. So astronomy as a career not necessarily mean that you only should know about the sky or about the uh, working of a telescope or you should know all the constellations by heart or all the names of the stars or the whole physics chemistry about the planets or the solar system galaxies and everything it also means supporting uh, astronomy at uh, uh, you know uh, based on your key skill set like i mentioned in the earlier you can be a lawyer and still do astronomy you can be a, a software engineer and still work with an astronomy organization and so on and so forth. Uh, a lot of people get confused. Uh, astronaut, they want to become astronaut. And mm -hmm. especially with the kids, if you go to a class five and you ask students, uh, what would you like to become when you grow up? About 80 to 85 percent kids will uh, say they want to become an astronaut. They want to go in space. Uh, as things grow, uh, as they grow, as, uh, uh, you know, the burden of education keeps increasing, the syllabus, their coursework starts to increase, uh, they start looking at uh, more conventional uh, fields like becoming an engineer, becoming a doctor, uh, an architect, and, uh, you know, uh, other different fields uh, that uh, will pay you well. Uh, this dream of becoming an astronaut dies. Uh, the major reason is that we really don't have that much exposure to it but with the companies like ours we try to give them as much exposure as possible and uh, the students can always consult with us they can come reach out uh, reach out to us if they have any query and these kind of projects and activities that i have mentioned uh, they are something which are uh, you know which really help them uh, get noticed among these institutions. If they if it goes in your CV, you get scholarships. Uh, you can get admission in uh, better colleges than what your marks can get you. Or, uh, you know, uh, you, you have that advantage over other students who are not participating in it. Uh, it doesn't mean that they are uh, uh, they are losing out something. Probably they are not interested in astronomy that much. But it definitely gives you an advantage. Now, uh, it's, a, it's a very vast field. All right. So uh, if, if I start talking about every aspect of astronomy uh, in terms of career, it will probably going to take a couple of hours at least. So what I would like to do is I would like to stop talking here and I would like uh, the students and other uh, from the audience to uh, ask question, uh, whatever your specific questions are, and uh, I would be happy to help. Thank you. Prina, you are muted. Uh -huh. Uh, you have taken all those questions, which, uh, as you said, uh, we, if we are young, we only think of uh, uh, being an astronomer as a career. But when we grow, when we have uh, various other options available, and also our interest gradually grows with our age, so we try to explore the many other. Uh, in our even in questions, students have mentioned that what what shall we do? How to uh, further pursue after class twelfth if we have interest in space and science? Earlier, they were only an option. They just want to be an astronaut if they are interested in space and science. So thank you for sharing that. And with this, we'll take some uh, questions. I think gradually then discussion will go ahead with that. So I am just posting first question. I think sir, uh, this is for you. I think people are interested uh, to know the future of any concept of any future rocket have made any concept Probably they are interested in any policy or maybe anything, uh, any. Um, 
I mean, we already have uh, seen in the last 10 years reusable rockets uh, from SpaceX and others. But I think uh, the future of rocketry is uh, if people can really unlock nuclear propulsion for uh, deep space missions. Uh, because, you know, at the end of the day, you want to have an energy source that propels and powers rockets uh, to go to, you know, infinite amounts of distances. Uh, and at the moment, uh, all the kind of uh, source of energy that we use on rockets are all limited uh, at the end of the day. So even, uh, you know, like a spacecraft like Voyager only could go to so far of a distance because of all the uh, nuclear technology that is on board on all of this. So I guess if uh, if you want a really a futuristic concept of rockets uh, that you want to work on, you should probably work on something like nuclear rockets. Indeed. And uh, what is the most skill for space entrepreneurship, Dhruv Chadda would like to ask? Yeah. I think what interest or maybe uh, what specific any qualification probably or maybe you wanted to ask what kind of a basic skill one should have if somebody wants to enter the space entrepreneurship. I mean, that's a very broad question, but I, yes. I mean, I, I, at the end of the day, all you need is possibly uh, I, nobody, nobody cares about your qualification. Uh, you know, people just qualify. People just uh, would like to know, you know, what you have to offer. And if whatever you have to offer is in demand and uh, and, you know, the quality is reasonable and you have a team that can provide it at a cost that they want to buy something at. So that's mostly it. It's space entrepreneurship is no different than any other entrepreneurship. Uh, it, it's uh, it's like, uh, it's, you know, any other thing. It's like you know, building a Kirana store or a Flipkart or anything like that. It's all the same at the end of the day. Space is just one uh, form of entrepreneurship. That's it. Uh, and also somebody has mentioned that uh, India is best budget when it comes to space exploration. So any comment on this? Uh, I'm answering all the questions. I don't know, Sne, if you want to answer this or. So I think this is related to you uh, because uh, further students are posting okay. related to the career options. So I probably yeah. Yeah. will be taking for Sne. Sure. So. Uh it's not a question of what is the best budget or so on again you know you cannot make a one on one comparison with anything uh, i'm sure that uh, you if you give if the government gives isro a bigger budget they will also be very happy to do mo more and more missions as well so uh, at the end of the day you know uh, the budget for space is often a percentage of the gdp so if you look at uh, you know 15 years or 20 years before if India spent 0.15% uh, of its GDP on space and China spent the same amount of money and the Indian economy and the Chinese economy were at the same level, uh, then the money spent is same in both the countries. But today, for example, the Chinese economy has grown about five times or six times bigger than the Indian economy. So even if they spend 0.15% of, uh, per of their GDP in pure percentage points uh, as same, the the money that they spend on space is still five times bigger uh, than what we spend. So it's simply a proportion of uh, you know what is being uh, built. Of course, you know our scientists are very good at uh, optimizing for cost uh, at the end of the day. But uh, you know nothing stops them. Uh, uh, I mean, we shouldn't really stop them in giving them more resources so that they can do more and more. Very true. But. Uh... Is there any scope for AI in space science? Otherwise, in general, AI as well. He also posted, is there is there any like uh, AI involved? In yeah, so uh, I can give you a few examples. Um, you know, for example, uh, today, uh, from a perspective of climate change and uh, and you know all of this ecology and so on. One of the ra ravishing things that are happening in the environment is uh, stuff like uh, wildfires. Uh, it's very, very, very hard to predict wildfires. Uh, it's one of the toughest things to do in science, actually, to actually uh, you know, predict when a wildfire is going to occur and detect a particular wildfire and to signal some of the services to actually tell them that there's a wildfire starting here and you have to go control it. So often a lot of the statistics actually show that if you can't really stop a wildfire in the first five or 10 minutes of it starting, 
you cannot stop it. Uh, it's like literally not possible by human beings to stop it in the first phase, right? So uh, one of the things that people are now working on is launching satellites, for example, that are intelligent enough to take into account uh, all the atmospheric conditions, climatic conditions on the ground, you know, the water content uh, and everything else, and use some very interesting sensors that are out there, which are, you know, very thermally cold sen sensors and so on to see if they can actually come up with a model that can detect uh, you know, wildfires at a very small level so that uh, you know, services can be alerted that there's a wildfire starting here. Right? So in this level of detection needs you know, satellite, a network of satellites and intelligence that can work 24 by 7 across the world, for example. Right? And you cannot have manual people looking at, uh, you know, exactly looking at uh, maps that are generated by satellites. So there are many, many, many such examples of uh, many use cases where you would want to have a 24 by 7 by 365 day uh, coverage of a certain aspect and looking at a specific problem that can be detected uh, from space, right? And so this is you know, one of the examples. So there are many, many such examples of uh, how AI can be used in uh, many such use cases. So for example, it could also be in floods you know, uh, to tell people uh, who are going to rescue, uh, you know, which routes they can take, for example, which are not still blocked or which are the hotspots where you can send your helicopters to so that people who are there in that zone can be rescued. Uh, you only have three or four helicopters available. No, you don't have an unlimited supply of equipment and manpower going and rescuing people, right? And it's very difficult to know if uh, there are floods and all the telecommunication towers are down. Uh, there's no way of people contacting each other and telling which are the priority zones, for example, right? So, and this way, you, if you use an element of space there, you can actually tell which are the hotspots, where are people uh, still stuck? Uh, and and oh, you can use all of these very intelligent things that you can do with machine learning and AI and things like that. And yeah, it really depends on which use case you want to build today. And, uh, and then, you know, how is it useful for the society at the end? Mm, yes. So uh, with this, we'll be taking next question. Uh, I think this is for Sne. How can astronomy help us in our daily life and what its use? Um, <clears throat> so uh, that's a very, uh, you know, it's a, it's a very vast uh, uh, topic. Uh, astronomy is helping us uh, in our day-to-day -day life. For example, if you look at what time it is or what date it is, it's all because of astronomy. When you uh, when you celebrate the new year, it's basically the sun has started a new round around the sun, and uh, uh, you can start from any date, and it, there is still a, a, a one year. Also, uh, the date uh, the, uh, the the one day of twenty four hours and one year of three sixty five days and uh, six hours, all of this has uh, come from astronomy. It it marks the movement of Earth around the sun or around its axis. If you look at the more uh, advanced and uh, sorry more latest or very recent development in space sciences, um, this this video conferencing, this is a product of uh, uh, you know space exploration uh, the wi-fi the high speed internet um, all all of this has come because uh, certain countries wanted to send their men or women into space and they wanted to talk to them all right uh, mobile phones uh, mobile technology or um, even uh, adult diapers for example that has come from uh, space exploration because uh, back in the days in the apollo missions astronauts were uh, you know put up in their space suits and they were waiting for 12 to 13, 14 hours in the capsule before the capsule would go up and they're like very teeny tiny capsules you can't afford to have a, a washroom in there for them to release so they have to do all their business inside the spacesuit and uh, later on uh, these uh, you know the product came out in the market uh, as adult diaper which now uh, the old age people are using and they are having a much happier and healthier life uh, so there there are tons of things that you can just look around and if you look at the history how and where it was invented right or how it came into existence you'll find it traced back to space exploration all right so uh, astronomy help us in our daily life at every single step uh, the, this the session 
uh, where you are learning all these new things you are interacting with uh, you know all of us it's all because of space exploration and uh, uh, because of astronomy uh, uh, one more thing i would like to add here uh, indian standard time uh, came into existence uh, not more than i think 150 200 years ago before that every uh, place every uh, locality every individual had their own means of uh, you know finding the uh, time of the day and uh, they uh, they would differ somebody sitting in uh, uh, gujarat and somebody sitting in assam uh, will have their noon time probably 2 hours apart from each other all right so assam will have noon earlier gujarat will have noon later both will have noon now everybody has noon at the same time this has also come based on our understanding of astronomy because we don't measure noon when uh, the clock shows 12 the clock shows 12 at 82 and a half degrees when uh, the sun is exactly overhead or it's transiting or crossing the uh, you know uh, the north south line so these are some of the things that we have, uh, you know, seen. Uh, aviation or uh, naval transportation, they all use the position of stars in the sky and they look at, uh, you know, they, they have their charts uh, based on which they can identify their latitude and longitude in the vast ocean or in the air above the clouds. Global positioning system. When you send your friend your location on WhatsApp, uh, the GPS uh, is taking your accurate location up to 12, 15, 20 meter of radius. And that satellite is uh, all because uh, somebody thought about using the stars to triangulate and, uh, you know, fix satellites at specific position so that they can find your accurate position and they can send your friend your exact location so that they can come see you. So uh, there are 1000 more examples I can just go on and on, but I think you got the gist. It's, it's everywhere and helps us in all the possible ways you can imagine and beyond. Uh, yes, even if we uh, when at the times when we're not using all these technologies, since that time we were using astronomy as a core because the pole star is one of the biggest example when there was no GPS and still we are finding positions and uh, right. helping us to find the ways. So even Indian Indian Navy and Indian uh, Army is still using to get the location because when the GPS stops, pole stars and the position help us to find the way. So astronomy is helping in all aspects of our life. Uh, I think this next question is also, also if uh, you both can want to take for you, Sne, and also, sir, if you want to help them. After 12th, if somebody would like to go in space, and this is the most common question, sir, even in the planetarium we uh, got. Students are interested in class 11th or 10th, 10th, 11th, and 12th, and they want to pursue uh, astronomy or a space science. So space, now it's a very vast area. There are hundreds, hundreds and thousands of uh, job opportunity. So if you can just elaborate as per your experiences. Uh, Sne, you would like to take first? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, so what to do after 12 by uh, which we will go to space line again space line is a very vast field where exactly in space line you want to be uh, you want to be an astronaut who can fly into space you want to be the technician who prepares the rocket you want to be the person who is uh, studying the data collected from the telescope you want to be the person who is building the software that does all the computation you want to be the person who is uh, hiring all these young pride minds to these uh, reputed organizations around the world you want to lead the organization or you want to contribute into the organization this is a very important question you have to ask yourself like i mentioned earlier also it really uh, does not matter what you do or, or what field you choose you can be a photographer, you can be an artist, and you can still contribute, uh, you know, in the field of space. You can be a software developer, you can be a hardware uh, developer. Like Sir here is uh, building systems uh, that he's supplying uh, to uh, the needy ones, the users, and then they are using the system to do various things, right? So you can do anything that you like, and you can combine it with space. I did mechanical engineering, 
but today I am communicating science of astronomy and space sciences in particular uh, with the masters. I'm running a company successfully. I am uh, happy where I am. So this might be one of the uh, career prospects for you as well. Or work hard, get your uh, advanced degrees in science, apply for the post of astronaut. Now ISRO is sending three humans into space and that means this this pandora's box has just opened there'll be more and more space exploration programs isro is going to undertake and there'll be more and more people required you can probably join in there and if you are uh, in grade 12 or younger you have got about 15 years of your life ahead when you can look at every intrinsic detail about your journey into uh, cosmos or space exploration so it all depends what you want to do and where you want to uh, see yourself in next 15, 20 years uh, once you are taken up the professional journey. So uh, anything is possible. Yes. Yeah. Would you like to add something uh, on this, sir? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, some of the most famous uh, people that are building very successful space companies have no education. So. <laughs> um, Peter Beck, who is the CEO of Rocket Lab, I, I think uh, uh, didn't even go to university uh, and is, you know, uh, has built a company that uh, uh, flies rockets. So that doesn't mean that, you know, you shouldn't go to university, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but yeah, essentially uh, there is, of course, everything is open at the end of the day. Um, Space uh, is uh, there's any any line of uh, career path is leading to space today. Like who knew like ten years ago, people who are studying biology and chemistry will be studying space, right? Yes. Who knew like yes. uh, you know people who are uh, lawyers are becoming you know space lawyers? Like even in India for that matter, you know twenty years ago possibly if somebody said I want to be a space lawyer in India, people would probably laugh at them, right? And today there are a healthy group of people who are lawyers who are studying space law and saying, oh, I want to become a space lawyer in India, right? Uh, there is a, a good chance that whatever you are good at, there's a possibility for you to get into space uh, in one way or the other, right? So you can do, uh, you know, whatever, engineering, you can do law, you can do biology, you can do chemistry, you can do um, people who are doing pharmaceutical research are looking at uh, doing uh, uh, pharmaceutical experiments that can only happen in microgravity so that the results of the those particular experiments can be uh, used to produce new drugs in uh, in the space environment because microgravity environment uh, you know creates a new uh, environment for for drug research which is not available here on the earth uh, there are people who are looking at manufacturing in space so where for example new types of fibers or crystals or things like that could be manufactured only in the space environment. And that gives a very conducive environment to produce some sort of new materials uh, that, can that can actually not be produced here on the earth. Uh, I mean, there are, space entertainment is becoming very famous. You know, there are people who are planning for space stations, space hotels, uh, things like that. So there's, uh, there's so many things, you know, there's also a company that I know here in France that is, uh, uh, you know, doing space wine. They are basically sending bottles of wine to space and maturing it and sending it back to the earth, uh, saying that, you know, the wine would actually mature differently in space than it would do on, on the ground. Right. So there's um, there are so many crazy things that you can do with space nowadays that uh, I'm sure that, uh, you know, in 10 years time, we will we can talk to each other and say, say that oh, we never knew that this could be done. Uh, that somebody will come up with this idea of doing something in space, right? So I think it's just a question of uh, um, it, firstly knowing what you're good at, and then uh, seeing if you can do the, you know, you can work with a team or do something in space with that. Very true, and I think our ed education system now it's interdisciplinary, and so probably give us more options now a uh, engineer can become an astronaut and an astronaut can become an artist and many other things is possible so yes it's very important as you both said first know yourself what you are good in did astronomer have good career in india so uh, so, so would you like to take and then snail will take your comment 
Uh, I think Snay is best uh, place to answer this, not me for sure. Uh, all right. Snay, uh, please, uh, would you like to comment on this? Um, a good career is, uh, uh, you know, again, something that you have to be more descriptive about. What do you mean by a good career? Uh, uh, you know, you I just want to add, Snay, uh, because students coming even in the planetarium and their parents also when they come here the main concern was that my, my son is good in this shall i buy him so much so much amount of telescope so that he can pursue his interest they are interested ki abhi just ne start kiya hai and they even don't know the basic idea about it but the ultimate goal is to become the astronaut. As these words, these fancy words are very much famous, like rocket, launchers, uh, play stations, space stations, and astronomer. So I think in, on that uh, concern, they have written career option as an astronomer. No, no, um, I, I completely get it. But uh, the, a good career uh, in India uh, is, is a very uh, vague term. So a good good is nothing but it is more of uh, uh, you know uh, it, it's subjective all right so uh, let's let's understand what is an astronomer doing uh, an astronomer is somebody who has uh, studied uh, deeply about uh, uh, one or two concepts uh, plus uh, a, a broader understanding of how many of the things in space work all right uh, they join uh, go institutions uh, in india or abroad uh, but mainly they are uh, someone who are, uh, you know, working as lecturers, as professors, uh, and so on and so forth. So they are hired by the universities or institutions where they are not only uh, doing their own research, but they are also teaching the students. All right. And they draw a, a good salary. Uh, because they all come under the government of India pay scale. So in terms of uh, money, uh, in terms of finances, uh, they do fairly good. Uh, there is nothing to worry about. Uh, whether they can achieve success in their field or not, that depends on many factors. First of all, what topic you have at hand. If you are talking about black holes or something like the God particle, uh, the, the improvements are, uh, you know, uh, the progress is a little slow, but it's not a dead end. But if you're looking at exoplanets, so there are, there are two, three spacecrafts which are currently scanning the sky. They are looking for exoplanets. And then there are, uh, you know, various tools to detect. Citizen scientists are participating. So things are really speeding up. So it also depends on which field you are going into. That way it will define your course, uh, whether you will attain success in 10 years, 50 years or you know maybe probably after uh, you are just a name uh, to people so they have a good career prospect in terms of there are many institutions and now the private organizations are also coming up as sir mentioned that there are many private companies who are now uh, working with isro to you know launch their spacecrafts and all they all need uh, astronomers they all need uh, technicians they all need these kind of people so there are various opportunities which are coming up and in next five to seven years, there'll be so much, so many opportunities that uh, having uh, becoming an engineer or becoming an astronomer may pretty much act, you know, uh, be at par to each other uh, in more than one ways. Very true. Uh, as I say, the rocket launches and everything, students are very much fascinated about all these questions. So somebody has posted, Vivan, how is the launch day, day of rocket decided? Like if we want to go to Mars, what all conditions are required? Very interesting question. Um, so there are many factors that uh, take into account the launch window. So basically, you know, uh, as you might know, um, the planets have their own orbits and uh, the distance of the planets with respect to the position of the Earth varies uh, over the course of the time as such so yeah you know the the window of time to mars uh, the closest that you can come uh, is about seven or eight months uh, is uh, is the shortest time you can get into uh, to mars from uh, from the earth and that time window comes every two and a half or three years i'm i'm no expert there but you know that's generally the the time frame uh, so essentially uh, what you would want to do is you want to optimize 
your resources spent in getting uh, from the Earth to Mars. And one way you can do that is actually find the, the most optimum time so that uh, the distance between the two objects become the closest uh, at the end of the day, right? So um, that's with respect to the planetary bodies. And uh, it's also true for different orbits uh, that as well. So for example, let's say you want to use uh, a polar sun synchronous orbit uh, that uses, uh, you know, for example, a camera that uh, you want to fly so that uh, you can uh, use the daylight of the sun more and more so that you can take pictures because of course you cannot really take any pictures if there is not very useful pictures if you are if there's always a eclipse and you know you're in the night uh, at the end of the day until, unless and until you're using something like synthetic aperture radar right so uh, it's uh, and in that case you know you're looking at uh, launch windows that uh, that become uh, let's say polar that target the polar orbit and 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 so on right so then you're lo really looking at uh, a launch window that supports all of this so this is a, a field called astrodynamics and uh, there's uh, basically people who do uh, trajectory optimization uh, launch window calculation depending on the mission depending on the payload and and so on and uh, in fact there's also people who do a massive amount of uh, phd studies and research studies dedicated to astrodynamics especially if they want to go beyond uh, just the Mars, Mars uh, orbit or you know the Venus orbit or so on, to, to really long distances. If they want to go to a certain uh, star where, you know, let's say uh, to a certain planetary body that they believe that uh, life could exist, you would also want to calculate possible trajectory optimizations to such a place that is far out somewhere uh, in, in the universe, right? So those are all uh, some of the things that you can do when it comes to trajectory optimization and and uh, look at which are the best paths you can actually take uh, so that you can reach out to that. Uh, I mean, if, if you want to add something there as well, Sneha, go ahead. Hmm. Yes, uh, Sneha, would you like to add on this? And also uh, with this, I think it's in co co continuation. So, Mar uh, sir, in Mars, what are the other supplies which are very important and must be carried along in order to survive there, except oxygen and etc.? cetera? Uh, Sneha, if you like to comment. Uh, so Naranser has uh, uh, so Naranser has explained it uh, very nicely and very uh, uh, simply. Uh, you want to go somewhere, you find out the best possible time and option, the shortest distance, the cheapest option, and uh, then you do it. Uh, the fields, the concepts, the ideas that he has mentioned uh, is exactly the same that I would have said. So, yeah. Uh, coming out to the last point, uh, that is uh, in Mars, what are the other supplies which are very important and must be carried along in order to survive there, except oxygen, etc. So uh, these supplies uh, depends upon uh, your uh, the type of mission. If you're sending a rover, then you don't need anything. Uh, it's just a rover and, uh, you know, uh, you're done pretty much. But if you are sending humans on Mars, then you have to have uh, 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 some kind of material that will be used to create their houses uh, where they will be living. It's like pitching a tent in the forest. Uh, then you have to have food. Then you have to have, uh, uh, you know, your space suits, your uh, uh, equipment, your tools, uh, based on what kind of experiments you have planned. You, know, you need to have, uh, you know, um, spare uh, tools or spare space suits or you know these kind of things so everything depends upon what kind of experiment uh, you are going to do or what kind of studies you are going to do of course uh, when when a country is sending their uh, you know uh, their resources on uh, a particular uh, uh, planet or moon they would like to uh, leave some something as uh, you know a matter of pride or dignity that we did it first like uh, we all know in uh, uh, you know uh, on moon we see uh, an american flag uh, was uh, uh, being hoisted space race there. so so that is something we we, we do there you know th these are more of the political things than the scientific things but yeah these these are some of the things that you will take uh, food is essential so pretty much anything that is essential for you to survive in that environment and to carry forward the task 
uh, you're assigned for, uh, that is, uh, you need to carry all of that. Yes. Uh, so uh, would you like to add something? Yeah. Sure. So uh, one of the things for human life to survive uh, that you need, of course, is oxygen. And, uh, you know, some of you might know, or might remember, or, you know, if there's also uh, the an interesting experiment that Perseverance uh, did back in April. Um, they, they had an instrument on Perseverance that could actually uh, split carbon dioxide, which is available in very high quantities, uh, into uh, uh, into oxygen basically on Mars, and that experiment was successful uh, earlier this year in 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 April. So that's one of the major breakthroughs, for example, uh, that allows uh, this kind of uh, uh, you know functionality, right? Because at the end of the day, you would want to have uh, uh, hydrogen and oxygen in some form or the other uh, that you can make uh, water and uh, and air. And those are the two main necessities of uh, life uh, that can support human beings uh, anywhere in the universe, right? So I guess uh, a lot of the current uh, technology development that is happening today is uh, what can we actually do that allows us to use materials that are on the particular planetary surface that we can engineer to support life? Uh, human life at the end of the day. So, and that's the most interesting area. And it's it's an area called in situ resource utilization, ISRU. And uh, there's a lot of uh, interesting research groups that are working around the world. Uh, the goal that uh, you cannot carry all your stuff uh, from the earth to any other planet as much as possible. It's going to cost billions of dollars at the end of the day. Uh, much more interesting approach to take is actually uh, sending out intelligent robots and uh, building up intelligent infrastructure uh, that utilizes the materials and the resources that a particular planetary body already has, and then uh, making stuff out of it uh, at the end of the day. And that's a much more cheaper approach to to take uh, to support uh, interplanetary, uh, you know, uh, uh, life at the end of the day, right? So uh, the next uh, wave of uh, you know interesting experiments that will come up in the next ten years or so are all such uh, rovers that are going to have uh, very interesting payloads that are uh, doing that will do experiments in this nature. So that's where I think uh, a lot of the ISRO research will actually head towards. Definitely. Uh, with this, uh, so many of the students were asking, how can we contact you? Probably is there any uh, any project or kind of an internship in which you are involving youth? Uh, you can please uh, elaborate and then say you as well. Uh, how youth, like how the students can be in touch with you? Is there anything, any plans for them your organizations are doing? Um, it's very for us uh, for me at least. I think uh, we already have a Discord server for all the space enthusiasts in India, uh, in one way or the other. Most of them are very young st students. Uh, we have the New Space India Discord server. Uh, you can find that on Twitter or you know just look for New Space India Discord. Uh, I think it's a public server now, so you can simply Google for it and then uh, join in. There's about a thousand people who are all interested in space related stuff uh, who are from India who are just hanging out there. And sometimes we conduct uh, like AMA sessions or quiz or you know stuff like that, or we invite other people to speak there. So that's one way to find uh, each other there and uh, help each other out. Definitely. I already posted in the chat box, New Space India is the only post podcast uh, from the India. So uh, Sne will take your last comment and then we'll wrap today's session because majorly, major, major things we have discussed today related to the careers. So we'll take your comment and then we'll wrap. Um, so uh, anybody who wants to get in touch with us can uh, uh, you know visit our website, um, send us an email or a WhatsApp. We generally work through school, so we we are still uh, you know not in a place where students and uh, our team can interact uh, you know more frequently like this. Uh, we have started a forum on our website that the students can you know just join for free and they can interact with other space enthusiasts. Uh, they can share their findings, their learnings, and they can ask questions. And our team uh, is going to uh, you know uh, answer these questions from time to time. 
So uh, these are some of the ways that the students can interact. For adults, uh, we organize uh, travel camps uh, where uh, you know any any individual who was interested in astronomy but for some reason hasn't pursued it as a career, they really wanted to you know get into it again. Uh, probably somebody has bought a telescope, doesn't know how to use it. So those guys can contact us and uh, we organize these programs every month around the new moon weekend. So they can join us. And uh, if you're looking to buy a telescope, you can again contact us. We have got uh, multiple brands and products available that you can use and start astronomy and astrophotography. So there are many ways you can just uh, uh, reach us uh, through our website. Go to astro-file.com and you'll have all the details. I'll just, uh, I don't know if I can mention in the chat. But, uh, no, yeah. I can, uh, you can, uh, uh, you don't have access for the chat, but I'll, I'll put it okay. in the chat box. Sure. So here a planetarium can play a vital role in between connecting you all. So in case, uh, maybe in future also, if you plan certainly something for the youth or for the school students, we'd love to collaborate on such uh, ventures and probably can help you to circulate the information because planetarium is the body in between uh, the students enthusiasts who are very much interested for such opportunities organized by uh, young uh, entrepreneur like you both so with this thank you so much narayan sir for giving your precious time and also snay for joining for today's session though we were planning this session from long back but uh, certainly today we uh, finally did this so really happy that uh, some way or the other we have uh, given some insight related to the all vast career options even uh, your experiences help students how to uh, like think in this direction and as you say there's sky is the limit and anyone can opt anything uh, whichever he or she is good in that so we'll take last last comment from you both and we'll wrap yeah, uh, thank you very much for inviting me and for the patience. I've been also, I guess, uh, traveling back and forth, and it's been some time, some difficulty in scheduling this. But uh, uh, I hope to meet you both in person in Delhi the next time I'm definitely, there. Definitely, definitely, uh, sir. And hopefully, you know, when we put this whole COVID thing behind us, we can have a little bit more of a in-person interaction. Definitely, uh, definitely. Everybody. We will love to host you, sir, in the planetarium, probably whenever you'll get chance to visit India and the planetarium. We'll love to host. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you very much. And Sneha, I would love to connect with you as well. So I'll, sure. I'll kind of request you on LinkedIn. Sure, or something. Yeah. sure, sir. I'll, I'll be sharing sure. his uh, that'll details. Be, that'll, be and, that'll be yeah. great. That'll be great. Yeah, absolutely. So, thank uh, you. So anything, sir, uh, uh, Sneha, last comment from your side um, to the students? Uh, it, it's always pleasure coming on this platform and speaking to the kids uh, and the enthusiasts. It's, uh, it's a great experience every time. And uh, thank you very much for organizing these talks. Uh, due to COVID, our interaction with the kids have been very limited and uh, uh, the learning has kind of slowed down. So thanks to these kind of uh, interactions, not only they learn interesting things, they get to meet interesting people like Naran sir. So it, it's, it's a, it was a great opportunity and I'm happy to be part of it. Thank you very much. Definitely, and, uh, it's certainly, a great, sir, great opportunity, sir, certainly for everyone. Yeah. Uh, looking forward to uh, connect with you. Yeah. All right, with this, uh, I'll take a uh, signing off. Thank you, everyone, for joining for today's session. Thank you, our guest, for sharing your experiences and knowledge related to your fields. We really hope to see you again in future, probably in the planetarium when certainly the COVID situation gets over. With this, take care. Bye. Good evening. Bye.